Hello and welcome to the Royal Horticultural Society's Chelsea Flower Show 2024, an event supported by the Newt in Somerset. Now, it's wonderful to be back here at Chelsea on the opening day of the most prestigious and talked about week of the whole gardening world. From ambitious garden designs to the expertise of the plants, men and women, it never fails to amaze us. And we'll be here all week exploring the showground to bring you a flavour of the Chelsea magic and some inspiration for your own gardens. That last point is always the one that I like most, because you come here and you're sort of looking around and you're dazzled, and then you hone in and you see bits and pieces. And combinations yeah. and colour themes, yeah. and, and it can be quite confusing. You think, I love the white gardener. Yeah. Oh, no, I want some more yeah. colour. Yeah. But it's show. It's all about drama and show. Yeah, it's and that's the great thing. Horticultural theatre, yeah. let's yeah. call it. Well, this is the Octavia Hill Garden, created in honour of one of the founders of the National Trust, designed by Anne-Marie Powell as a community space. It's all about celebrating the joy of gardens and how everyone should be able to access green spaces. Monty, it's very vibrant. I find it really uplifting being on this garden. I love it. I, I walked past yesterday, saw it, and immediately you just feel better. You feel better about the whole thing. And, you know, you and I know Anne-Marie very well. It's her character. It's exuberant. There's lots going on. Yeah. Wonderful planting. Fabulous sort of wood and oh, hard the structures. landscaping. I yes. was slightly concerned. There's so many structures in yeah. here, but they all combine beautifully and soften with the planting. It sings out. It really... And some, you know, really exciting colour combinations that I will be snapping on my phone and taking home. I think there is that thing that the, there's always at Chelsea, a certain tone, certain colours that come through. I'm seeing this lovely plum oh. poppy. Okay. I'm seeing that around. Absolutely fantastic. And, of course, we'll be spending a lot more time here, as everywhere else. You certainly will. Well, this garden has certainly got us excited to see more. Coming up tonight, there are some hugely creative gardens on Main Avenue this year, featuring enormous structures to planting on an impressive scale. We'll be taking a first look at some of the other finished show gardens. Ahead of Medals Day tomorrow, our medal-winning design expert, Adam Frost, explains what the judges are looking for before they award the show garden medals. If you have limited space at home or even no space at all, there's plenty of inspiration at the show for you, as Rachel Detame and Arit Anderson have been finding out. And, of course, there are over 70 world-class exhibits of horticultural excellence to enjoy in the Great Pavilion. And tonight, our queen of the pavilion, Carol Klein, is taking a closer look at one of the standout displays that has caught her eye. But now, first thing this morning, RHS Chelsea 2024 was declared officially open. And there's been a real buzz around the showground all day. When you're stood in a, in a lovely garden, it's just a joy. Just to be outside with nature, taking in the air and to appreciate life itself. I think it's important to take those moments to do that. It's actually genuinely a, a highlight for the year. I'm a keen gardener and so I come here to try and flag bits for the garden, get some ideas. It's also just the people spotting. <laughs> My biggest memory of our garden growing up was that my mum would chuck us out into the garden to play and we would bury all her <laughs> cutlery and crockery and she'd let us do it just to keep us quiet, really, they, didn't you? Unfortunately, they didn't grow to be more <laughs> silverware. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we arrived at 9 o'clock and we were chomping at the bit. It was like Black Friday for us. So we make as much of our time here as, as possible. We love it. It's great. It's one of my favourite days of the year. Well, we're looking at a beautiful garden right now. It's the Waterade Garden. Which is what's cool about Chelsea. You see all of these compacted beauty, this kind of cornucopia of different gardenal delight. My world is about the here and now. Gardening is about the long-term plan, the long-term future. And I think it's allowed me to be patient a little bit more. I've never been before, and I've come with my mum and my sister, and we're just here to be inspired and to realise how bad we are at gardening. Great inspo of the little shed that has an arger in it. It's the most middle-class shed I've ever seen in my life. Love that. 
this is a great example of how you can connect with nature, with people, and with yourself. With yourself, the most important thing is to feel good about who you are. And that's what gardening does to you. It's great to see everybody enjoying themselves. I wonder if they know how much work goes into one of these I gardens. I'm sure they don't. I mean, I know from you talking to you and talking to everybody who works here, it's a year of your life preparing. Yeah. All the details, all the skills going in, and then an incredibly compressed period. What is it, three weeks? Three weeks on site is so yeah. intense. You know, everything's got to come together. You've got to have plan A, B, C, D, Z. Uh, but at the same time, it's the creativity, the artistry of putting a garden together. And, of course, you've got the weather to watch. You've got the weather, and don't we know about the weather? <laughs> you, you can't have failed to notice that here in the UK, we've had a wet old start to the year, and you may think that we've had rather a lot of rain. But water is a precious resource, and this year the show is exploring how to capture it, store it and preserve it. Having too much or too little water is a big challenge for everyone. And two Chelsea Gardens are highlighting innovative ways to use water wisely on two very different scales. Sophie went to visit them as they built the gardens. So you can, like, Tom perch. Massey. Hello. You, you're <laughs> a uh, sucker for punishment here, aren't you? Look at this. What's this, your fourth garden? Fourth garden here, yeah, yeah. And this time, your biggest plot. Yeah, uh, this, this plot here is the biggest size you can have on Main Avenue. So this is 12 by 22 metres. So you brought in a bit of help. I brought in Jay. And Jay, your role in this? I'm an architect, but we're a co-designer for this garden. I design its structure and make sure it's safe and it's a perfect shape that we're looking for. What are you creating? So this is the water aid garden and it is all about the importance of rainwater harvesting. Very fittingly. Yep, very fittingly Giving today. Me, yeah. Uh, yeah, showing you that water is abundant and at times scarce. Water all over the world is being affected by the climate crisis. So we're using Chelsea Flower Show and this garden here is a way to get people thinking about water in this country. So how does that get reflected in this garden? So the garden was actually designed to create a layer of landscape. So the rain will fall on the structure and then it will be actually caught and then it will be filtered down into the ground tank. We are storing it for the future use. And you're demonstrating that very clearly with what you're planting up here because they are not staying on the ground, are they? What are you going to do with them? So what we're going to do tomorrow is we're going to section into two parts and lift up the two funnels at the same time and then we'll provide the columns at the base so it have a solid ground and then we'll marry them up. So they're going to stand like that on a column, yep. yeah, four very, of them. It, yeah. Yep. The spiral cladding is kind of like water going down a plug hole. Have you ever tried this before? Not in this way, no. In our heads. In your heads. <laughs> we, we... I, love it. I knew you were going to say that. Well, you guys, there is enough pressure on your shoulders. I'm getting out of here. So I'll leave you to it, all right? Enjoy sure. the mud. It's really impressive what Tom and Jay are doing on Main Avenue, but I'm about to meet another duo who are tackling water management on a somewhat smaller scale. Wow, Naomi, Ed. Hi. What is this that you're creating? We're making a magnificent, monumental water feature designed to hold as much water as possible but also look great at the same time. And these are sort of, uh, what, water butts that you will use in your domestic garden? Yeah, we're showing lots of practical and affordable things you can do to make space for water in your garden and, and have a more flood resilient garden than home. Right now we're literally standing in a hole. I've got a house facade there. Give me an idea, describe what this garden is going to look like when it's done. Well, it should be a showcase of all the different things you can do to adapt your home and your garden to be flood resilient. We're going to be looking up at a pergola that's going to have disconnected downpipes, so the water from the downpipes will be running along in large gutters, coming along and cascading down rain chains into these wonderful tanks. And from these, the water will be released into a swale and then down to a pond behind us. Wow. And what happens if Chelsea is boiling hot this year? Well, We've we have got, a coming plan. We do, we do. Go yeah. on. So we're going to make it rain. You're going to make it rain. <laughs> we've got a special effects company helping us make it rain. This is first time at Chelsea, isn't That's it? That's right. How are you feeling? Excited. Absolutely yeah. thrilled. Not nervous. Well, obviously nervous. You've got to be a bit nervous. A little bit nervous. <laughs> you've got plenty of water to contend with here already. I'm going to leave you to it. Good luck. See you later. Bye.
happy if we can get all this done now. Yeah. Uh, Tom, Jay, this looks incredible. This is just extraordinary what you've done here. Structure in the air. It's yeah. amazing. How was it getting all this up there? A lot easier than we thought, actually. Really? Um, we scheduled it for two days, but it went up at four hours. Plant survived on the roof. Bit of touching up, bit of repairing, but nothing major. Now you get a real sense of the different levels of the garden here. Yeah, so we've got four layers. You've got the very dry roof, then you've got the kind of drier uh, band of planting, which would very seldom be flooded. Then you've got wet meadow, so this would occasionally get flooded. And then you've got aquatics and marginals in the swales and in the pond at the bottom, so that would be wet a lot of the year. When I saw you last week, you looked like you were way ahead of everybody else because you were planting all these already. <laughs> but actually, this is a big space, isn't it? You've got a lot of work to do still. It is. I think we probably planted, what, 15%? It's just that we made another landscape above us that needed to be filled. So we basically increased our size of the garden in three dimensionally. The entire garden is planted. So even under these decks, you can see those plants going in here, plants going in all the way along all the corners. We've got lots of finessing to do. So are you going to be ready? You go through waves of thinking you're never going to finish, but we've got a really good team here. We're all going to crack on over the next few days, and we'll, yeah, we'll definitely get it done. Yeah, it looks amazing already. Well, well done, both of you. And I'll see you next week. See you next, next week. See you Bye. next week. Naomi. Hello. Sophie, hi. This looks hi. amazing. What a transformation. Thank you. How's it going? Uh, it's going really well. The leaps and bounds on the hard landscaping. And when you last came, obviously, it's a complete mud bath. So we've done some work on that. Yep. And you're standing on our lovely patio there, where the water's going to rise up through it and then drain away, like the rising tide, which is exciting. The pergola's up and getting on with the planting, of course. Tell me about the planting then, because it's very specific, isn't it, to this garden? It's extremely specific. So the garden's designed on the basis of suds, sustainable drainage. In its simplest sense, it's three tiers. You've got the very top of the slope, so the water runs down. Everything up there is you know, really well drained. And then around the centre, you've got a kind of resilient selection of plants that will take a range of conditions. You have the ferns, your foxgloves, your geums. At the bottom, we've got Beautiful marginal plants, bog plants. I'm basically standing up to my ankles in bog as we speak. <laughs> Press day, a week today. Are you going to be ready? I really hope so. We still have some challenges ahead. So, like yeah. what? Well, for a start, if we're going to create mounds and, and, and slopes this dramatic, actually getting the plants to stick to them has been a problem. I was just thinking over there. I mean, that, for yes, example, is so looking that's it's quite bit, an angle. That, that's it's going to be a little bit like planting a ski jump. <laughs> um, the worst clear scenario is it all cascades into the pond, and, 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 and I'm, I'm there on press day, kind of in my wellies, fishing it all yeah, out. Yeah, that, that wouldn't be good. So yeah. let's, let's hope that doesn't happen. I shall be back to have a look. Good luck. Thank you very much. Can't wait. Well, the garden is now finished and looking immaculate. I have to say it is really impressive and I love the way that it's dealing with the complexity of water because Chelsea Gardens, by and large, uh, have a big hit and they show you something and it's dramatic and that's it. But this deals with the dryness, the absence of water with really superb rock face there. And then the water coming through, collecting water on the roof and of course this dry garden that nobody can see uh, unless you've got a camera up in the sky and yet it's all part of the garden funneling it down and then you reach the lower levels beautifully planted but what's really impressive is the way that using these this grid system it's allowing for change the planting is adaptable so it could be that i would be walking under various few inches of water but the planting would still survive. And I think that degree of complexity and flexibility is really unusual here at Chelsea. Jay, Tom, congratulations. I, I just think this looks superb. And we've seen the enormous lengths you went to to create it. Uh, first of all, are you happy? Really, really very happy. Really very happy. Yeah. I love the way that you sort of built flexibility into the design and the planting. I mean, you've got, you've got your dry areas and, and, and coming through. In terms of planting, yeah. Was that a complicated thing? Yeah, I think trying to get that dry to wet shift is always a, a yeah. difficult thing to achieve. So you've got Iris Germanicas at the top, Sibiricas at the bottom, and, and then the kind of transitional space through. But I think trying to get that right and make it feel natural is quite a, a challenge. 
but presumably a challenge that we're going to have to, all of us, going to have to deal with more. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to be designing in resilience, designing in adaptability, and having a huge array of biodiversity by its very nature is, is resilient. We're obsessed with, with wet because we've all had the, the wettest winter we've ever known. Mm. But we've got to deal with dry too. It's the absence of water. So tell me about the storage. Mm. How you, how, what different ways are you storing water here? So this pavilion actually draws down the, the rainwater and it yeah. stores a below ground tank. And so you can use it very dry weather. And yeah. for past few years, we had a very wet and yeah. also very dry, dry weather. And also this landscape actually holds the water for a longer period of time. Right. Uh, swales will go up and fill up during the wet period. Uh, it's worth my head. Swales is a word that <laughs> none of us used until yeah, about yeah. five years ago. Now, yeah. of course, they're, they're hot. Everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and here at Chelsea, you're here for a week. It's going to look fantastic. What's the future of this garden? So it's going to go to a public garden in the north of England and right. live on as a place of water aid to tell people about sustainable water management right. and help uh, talk to people about how important rainwater is and that we should all be harvesting, storing and utilising this precious resource. And we can do that in, in, in our normal back gardens just as we can in the show garden. You, you know, you dig a small pond, disconnect your downpipe, right. so many okay. ways. Well, thank you both. Thank, thank you, you very much. Cheers, thank you. Here is the finished flood resilient garden. Naomi and Ed have done a great job. And on first glance, it does look quite familiar, like a back garden you may find up and down the country. But if you take a closer look, it's a rather clever garden. Hello, Naomi and Ed. Lovely Hello, to see Joe. you. Hello. It's a very thrilling garden as well, isn't it? This boardwalk, you feel you know really elevated yes. above the above the pool. That's here. how you get across. That's how you escape from the flood. It's great. I'd say, and the, you're worried about planting up the banks. They're Absolutely. Quite, well, they're very lush, beautifully planted. In fact, the whole garden is is, is sort of very immersive. Yes. I would say. Absolutely. That was very much the intention. We got around what was essentially planting a ski jump by a little bit of judicious terracing, um, but. <laughs> The idea is you kind of go into the garden and you've got all this lush greenery, it comes up above you, it keeps you cool, makes you feel secure and a, way, a long way away from the sort of the fear and the concern that flooding, the flooding brings. Well, exactly. I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Mm. It's, about, it's about dealing with the water that lands on your building and on your plot and putting yes. it back into the water table. But you've also made a very beautiful garden out of this space too. Mm. Yeah, so it's peaceful and it's purposeful. So we're, we're making space for water, one in eight gardens has flooded in the last year so there's there's a lot that we're showing there's a lot we're doing whether it's the disconnected downpipe cascading it along the gutter and into our rain chains and and, and the tanks so that's 10 bathtubs of water we got there and there's a hundred in the hundreds in the garden around <laughs> us that could be held so that could reduce flooding from 10 homes around us so it's got that impact as well okay yeah so um, it's it's really i think just showing showing the way and showing what you can do in a small garden and, and what the differences we can all make you can also make rain here apparently Is uh, that we true? can yes how do you do that wizardry 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 joe well, apparently later on in the week there's going to be quite a bit of rain anyway. So, so this garden is going to be put to the test. It yeah. is. Well, fortunately, the steep slopes mean that it should drain really, really well into the sump. The sump is designed around a dynamic river system, so it's OK if it rises and it's OK if it falls. So we're ready for it. You can cope with anything here. Yeah. Congratulations. It really is a lovely garden. Thank you very well much done. indeed. Well Thank you. Done. Now, over in the Great Pavilion, there's just as much skill and innovation on show as there is here on the gardens. All this week, we'll be taking a closer look at some of the standout displays. And to kick off, Carol's gone to explore an international exhibit that's returning after a four-year break. This magnificent, majestic stand represents the Cape Flora of South Africa. The Cape has one of the richest floras in the entire world with so many different plants. And that's represented here by using this wonderful cracked wall that runs right the way through. It's made of cracked clay and it's separating one biome, one geographic area from another and showing you the plants that live there. It's just wonderful. It also binds everything together with this great sinewy line that runs right the way through. The stand is absolutely bursting with every kind of protein you can possibly imagine. It's so tempting to think, oh, I want to grow these in my garden. But despite global warming and climate change, very few of us could possibly overwinter these plants. 
But there is one plant on the stand that all of us could grow in our gardens. It's a chincharinchi, a member of the hyacinth family. It's a bulb. And if you start it off in March or April in pots and then put it out into the garden, when you're sure there's going to be no more frost, then it will thrive, flower, all summer long. A taste of South Africa amongst all those other plants that come from there, that grace our gardens. The designer Leon Kluger brought displays to Chelsea in 2018 and 2019. I've been lucky enough to visit him at home in South Africa. It is so thrilling to welcome you back to Chelsea. We missed you so much. It's yeah. wonderful. And we miss you a lot <laughs> as well. We have so much flowers to show off to you. Yeah, exactly. And you couldn't have made a, a more magnificent show than this. It's beautiful. Now, lots of people say that Proteus, they're all the same, but this, you've proved them wrong. How dare they? <laughs> Proteus are so diverse. <laughs> and the reason for why Proteus are so diverse, and some of them don't even look like Proteus, is because of the Southern Cape's climate. I mean, we have very dry, and then you drive 10 kilometers, and then it's very a wet area. Yeah. So the plants change to adapt too. So there's a lot more than you see in the flower market. Which are your favourites? Well, I have to be honest, I love the Blushing Bride, Cerureus. What about the Rastios? Oh, one of my favourite things. We have so many species and each one a different texture. Yes, well, you've done it so magnificently. I just, I can't imagine how we managed to do Chelsea without you. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> If you don't have a lot of outdoor space, then there is still plenty of creative ideas to get excited about, especially in the smaller gardens and houseplant studios here. This year, many of them are taking inspiration from around the world, as Rachel and Arit went to discover. We've been let out, Rachel. I know, <laughs> this is a treat. Don't tell anyone where we are. <laughs> This is brilliant because as a gardener I'm so often focused on the plants that are outside in the garden and actually there's a whole world of other plants that we can grow if we just give them this bit of protection indoors. No you're absolutely right and I think what they've done here which is very clever I'm seeing this map and I love the fact that we can really buy into that idea of you know, what we can grow. There's yeah. all these cards which relate to the colours on the map there. Yes, it's almost like being in a library. Yeah. <laughs> a library card. So what have I got here? Uh, I've got a Chinese banyan. Oh. And it's actually really good because it's compact, slow growing, and also really lends itself to this kind of bonsai effect yeah. as well. So no, it's lovely, gorgeous, really lovely shape. It? I'm in North America here, and the common name is a golden pothos. So, lovely trailing plant. It's a good one for beginners. But I mean, that's the thing about house plants is that they are from all over the world. Mm. You've got so many different conditions, so therefore, there is going to be something that you can grow for your home. Well, there's a whole world of plants out there for small gardens, so let's go and explore, right? <laughs> British gardens are full of plants that are not native and that's wonderful because you can evoke holidays that you've enjoyed and you can have a completely different atmosphere in the middle of the UK. So here for example, just on this balcony garden which is a fairly small space, we've got from Australasia the tree fern, we've got from Asia the hosta and then there's this wonderful rather contorted shape of the Hesperallo, these very skinny leaves and winding stems here and that has come from Mexico and it, in fact this is a really good one for a pot because it stays nice and compact. We've got larger things like the cornus here which is a dye product used in Egypt and underneath more familiar plants things like the astrantia and the geum which are more from a temperate European type climate. So here we have all sorts of things, memories of holidays, very beautiful and in a small space. Rachel, come and look at this one. Isn't it gorgeous? It's wonderful. You find all the best places, though, <laughs> invariably. 
And the influence here is the sort of Moorish gardens, mm -hmm. isn't that paradise garden idea that started from ancient Egypt, really, through Persia, through into the Middle East. It's got a real sense of place. It has, it has. And bear in mind, this is four metres by three metres. Yeah. So to take that worldly inspiration into here, I think it's very clever. Mm -hmm. Symmetry, mm -hmm. very important in that style of garden. The key aspects of water was always sort of known for those Moorish gardens. And when you look around and look at the planting, you've got the rose, which is very classical in a garden like this, but you have to have the herbs as well. Of course, yeah. something aromatic, so yeah. the lemon of the mm -hmm. the rosemary. And I love the salvias as well, different types of salvia, different colours, and of course, the original yeah, here, which, which is so gorgeous. But the other thing that strikes me is that by using these pale colours, the whole thing feels really lifted, even though it's a small space. And that's the thing, isn't it? The amount of inspiration that's come into this garden, all those spaces from around the world. Definitely. You and I, we've had a dash around the world <laughs> and we haven't left SW3. <laughs> Well, there's a lot still to come tonight on the RHS Chelsea Flower Show 2024, an event supported by the Newt in Somerset, including the much-anticipated visit from their majesties, the King and Queen. But first, we're here in the centre of the Great Pavilion, and this year the RHS have partnered with UBS to create this new exhibit that celebrates the expertise of the small nursery. It's a collaboration of four nurseries. She Grows Veg, Kitchen Garden Plant Centre, Kent Wildflower Seeds and the Cayley Brothers, who all grow either wildflowers, edible plants or mushrooms. Now I see we've got, we have got a polytunnel. Yeah. Lovely polytunnel. I feel um, a bit overdressed for going well, in a polytunnel in a suit. <laughs> this, this is my working environment really, but of course what it shows is that these small nurseries, which hold so much expertise, yeah. actually have the same sort of kit as we all do in our garden. Basic stuff. Some, some compost, lots of seedlings, cuttings coming through. These are just one or two people working yeah. it, and then it comes outside. But you don't need a big no. polytunnel. You can grow it on a windowsill, yeah. a conservatory, yeah. any, any little protected spot. But yeah. Nice to have though. Very, well, I know you've got a nice greenhouse. Yeah. I think these raised beds are working really well because they're all mixed in. But it works. It does work. Now, you'd never see corn and thyme and lettuce no, no. You know, all growing in the same container, but it's just showing you what, what is possible. And also, once you've got these going, things like the fennel, um, you can just harvest your own seed from it, keep it going. Thyme, you can take little cuttings from yeah. Yeah, easily. And I, and I think there is a real democracy in empowering people to grow something edible, even if you've got a window box. And I have to say, seeing fungus grow here at Jersey, when, you know, when was the last time that... that a plant, big display of fungi and mushrooms. Yeah, yeah. it looks great. I think this whole thing, and yeah. the, like you say, it's encouraging to people to sow seed, which is such a simple yeah. process. You don't need all the gear, yeah. and you can produce lots of air away. Yeah. Now, roses are always a huge hit here in the Great Pavilion, and rose-growing masters, Peter Beale's roses, have been on quite the journey of their own this year to get their flowers ready for Chelsea. People love roses because they're so versatile. You've got the scent. You've got long flowering, so they'll flower anything from April right the way through until November, December time. They can be up walls, obelisks, bushes, all sorts. I'm Ian Limmer, nursery manager at Peter Beale's Roses. I've been there for 47 years. I started as a Saturday boy, just wanting pocket money. He obviously found something that he liked in me, and then I went as a, an apprenticeship for three years and just worked my way up, and here I am now, nursery manager. We've got 45,000 roses in this field, and they're all one variety. The variety is called Rosalaxa, and that's the rootstock. What we do is we propagate onto that rootstock the variety what we want to grow. This is established rootstock. So what we do is we put the variety from here and bud it onto the rootstock. So what we need is a piece of wood that thick and not interested in the flower. We take the leaf off and then what we do is we take the bud off like that, take the wood out of the back, make a T incision into the rootstock, lift the bark, insert the bud, chop the excess bark off, and then 
we put a rubber tie around it and that's how you bud a rose. And then what happens around January time, we take the top off, then around February, March time, the bud that we put into the rootstock starts growing and you know, during the summer months, it then produces a plant like we've got here and then November time, we're able to sell it. So that's the whole process, about 18 months to two years. This is our two acre rose garden. We've got thousands of plants in here. We have roses for any aspect. We've got roses that can climb, we've got standard roses, we've got lovely shrub roses, and we've got roses that are quite happily grown in pots. We've got everything. We've got climbers and ramblers that can go over all sorts of structures. Here we've got a climbing rose called Pippin growing over an obelisk. One of the common questions that are asked is what is the difference between climbers and ramblers? Climbers generally repeat flower and have larger flowers on the end of the stem, and ramblers generally tend to flower for a shorter period, about four to five weeks, giving us what we call the wow factor, covering the whole structure from bottom all the way up to the top. When you're training climbers and ramblers, the best thing to do would be to lay them horizontally where you can, because um, this then becomes the top, and then you will get flowers coming from there, there, and there, and so on, instead of just at the top there. So that's quite a good thing to remember. We've noticed there's a bit of a trend coming back more towards some of the wild species roses. This one here, Rosa headleyensis, really beautiful flowering end of April time. We've got another one here called Rosa sefalta. They will grow in woodland, they'll grow in wild sort of areas, and they just poke their flowers through beautifully for about four or five weeks. We've had 28 gold medals at Chelsea Flower Show. The pressure is quite intense, especially getting the roses out in flower. But I think I've done 46 Chelsea, so I'm just beginning to take it in my stride a little bit, but you can never take it for granted that we're going to get another gold medal. For Chelsea this year, we're working with the RNLI uh, to celebrate their 200th anniversary. On a personal level, I'm so excited because my grandfather served for the RNLI for 30 years. Here are the roses in the glass houses ready for Chelsea Flower Show. We put in about 3,000 roses to get about 1,500 that are perfect you know, for the stand. We're launching a rose for the RNLI, it's uh, with courage. It's a very special rose. When it first starts, it starts off of that orangey colour. It reminds me of the orange of the lifeboat and then it turns to almost a, a peachy yellow of their life jackets. It can grow in almost any position, it can go into a pot and last year we cut several flowers and brought them in and the scent was lovely. It's a very tough, resilient rose. This will help and reflect what they do. Over the last you know, two or three months we've had some very, very bad cold conditions. We've been walking through the glass houses, they're on target and suddenly m the stress levels will be going down because they will be there. There will be a Chelsea, we will have a wonderful stand. And here is a magnificent display from Peter Beale's roses. Ian, I've just got to say, watching you graft, doing that, you know, oh, here's the bar, just make an incision, there you go. Look, it's all done. You make it look so easy. There's a man who's been doing it all their life. Well, that's right. I've, I've been doing it since I was 16, and it's quite a back-breaking job. You're bending down there like that, but a, a good contractor can do the whole process in about six or seven seconds. Wow. So we have to bud probably 100 to 200,000 roses every single year. Well, it's worth it for us. Because, I mean, look at the RNLI rose that you've brought here. Is, it's absolutely stunning. It's beautiful. Are you, you. Are you pleased with the display here? Oh, it's... A, the, the whole display has just worked out so well for us, but we're extremely delighted with the RNLI uh, with Courage Rose. It's uh, obviously for a good cause and so on. We're going to be donating 20%, so therefore, you know, we're hoping to raise many thousands of pounds, but the colour is so good. You know, you've got the, uh, the peachy apricot orange fading to the yellow. It sort of picks up the rib of the boat and then the... Well, well it sort of picks the up the rib of the boat. I'm quite glad it's not that, that orange. orange. <laughs> that is quite hard to work with. This is much softer. It's Thank more apricot. There's more copper. 
Yeah, in there. that's I, right. I really love that colour. It's almost got the habit of like a, a shrub rose, so it's not an upright sort of formal uh, rose. And one or two of the shoots can go a little bit taller, could even be used as a small climber on an ob obelisk or a small wall as well. And, yeah, it'll just flower all summer long? All summer long, right, you know, off, off and on. You've got to be careful all summer. It might need a little break, but really off and on all through the summer and well into the autumn. Yeah. And, oh, someone's won something so, over there. There we go. Well, you've also got your beautiful wild roses on in the back there. Rosa Glauber right. is one of my favourites, and I'm glad to hear they're coming back. Well, I think, you know, you have to have the whole lot, from the, the squeaky new to the old traditional, really old species roses. And we mustn't forget, those roses will grow in woodland, they'll grow in, in a poor conditions, and... They'll flower for about three or four weeks, but the beauty of those, they also have beautiful hips later on in the autumn. And with, you know, some of the foliage, yeah. it turns autumnal. They, are, they really are wonderful, and you're right, they are coming back. Yeah, the whole, you've got the whole range here. Well, hopefully some champagne corks will be popping for you <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> but congratulations. Thank you very much. It's a really wonderful. Thank exhibit. you, Joe. Well, there are many designers and growers hoping to win gold on medals day tomorrow. But when it comes to the main show gardens, just what are the judges looking for? With seven goals to his name, one man who should know by now is Adam. I am going to try and explain to you what it takes to win a gold medal here at the Chelsea Flower Show. It's not that much simple process to understand but I'm gonna try all right so the first of all you've got a group of judges that will come onto your garden have a good look round and they will score you so it breaks down into nine categories and within that you want an excellent or maybe a very good or a good or a satisfactory or or you don't really want this but a poor so think school report but just to simplify, we're not going to talk about all nine. We're going to break that into three. So it's design, construction, and planting. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll have an idea what it takes. A lot of times you hear designers talking about their brief, which is ultimately the story of the garden. But the designer writes it. They set out very early on what they're trying to achieve with their garden. But that 2D then has to change into 3D. It comes alive. The walls, the buildings, even the trees. How does it feel? These forms, these masses, these open areas. So you're gluing all these different things together to create that perfect garden. And then we have the construction. Think about it, these are built in 20 days, but they need to be real. So that construction, the finishes, that demonstration of real craft. Next, we're looking at the planting, which I know for most of us are the stars of the show. But if you're a designer, especially like me, it's the bit that keeps you awake but what are the judges really looking for i suppose first of all it's that visual impact wow and then we look at color form texture how's the eye led but also we need to go back to the 3d mass when i was talking about the buildings and the walls it's the same with the planting you think about the trees the shrubs how does it break the space up how does it make it feel and once you've done all that, then it's looking at plant density, plant health. So achieving that gold medal is not easy. But if you do, I know that feeling is amazing. This year, RHS Chelsea is celebrating the many ways that trees can be of benefit to our gardens the environment, and of course to our own well-being. And the former RHS Young Designer of the Year, Ulla Maria, makes her Chelsea debut with an ambitious forest bathing garden for the charity Muscular Dystrophy UK.
I love being in nature for as long as I can remember. I used to spend every summer being immersed in the garden, so I feel this innate connection to nature. I am Ulla Maria, a garden and landscape designer, and this is my first year designing a garden at Chelsea. I was born in Lithuania. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a landscape surrounded by meadows and I really remember the memories of me going into the garden and picking strawberries and climbing the apple trees. And also my parents and grandparents were all into gardens and gardening, as well as my great grandparents had their own tulip nursery. And I just came to be a garden designer in a very natural way without planning to do so. This year felt like the right time to do Chelsea because Project Given Back have linked me up with the Muscular Dystrophy UK charity who support people with muscle weakening and wasting conditions. I was really inspired by a guy called Martin. He told me how he was in his early 20s when he was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy and he found himself walking out of the hospital and going to his car because there was no other outdoor place for him to go to process his thoughts. And I just thought Martin's story could have been quite different only if we could provide high quality outdoor spaces where people could go outside of these hospital environments. The design of the garden is inspired by the ideas of forest bathing. Today I've come to Wakehurst, this amazing botanic garden with over 500 acres of various woodlands and forests. And it's places like this that I draw inspiration from. And I'm looking forward to starting with some forest bathing today. So Helena, what exactly is forest bathing? The name for forest bathing is inspired by the Japanese practice called Shinrin Yoku, and it means bathing in the atmosphere of the forest. It benefits us on so many levels, mentally, emotionally, uh, physically. It has been proven to boost our immune system, calm our nervous system, regulate blood pressure, uh, slow heart rate, just generally give us an overall good feeling of peace and calm. I think I'm quite attracted to this little bit over here because there's a little opening and the tree canopies are coming in and we will have a little snippet of that at Chelsea so I'm gonna go with this spot. <laughs> so let's just begin with bringing your awareness to your breathing. Feel the weight of your body onto the earth and for a moment listen for the sound of space. Gently and slowly allow your eyes to open. Notice all the colours. Notice the shapes, the crossing branches, the overlapping leaves. Thank you, that was really peaceful and I feel really grounded and I hope that we can try and bring a little bit of this experience to our Chelsea garden. I love the idea of creating an immersive garden experience. Here, yeah, the idea is to bring the forest down to Chelsea. And in order to do that, we will have more than 50 birch trees in our garden to make this experience possible for everyone to enjoy. You're in the right place here in the National Birch Collection at Wakers. We have over 50 species of birch trees, uh, so hopefully you'll find some inspiration here. This is uh, one of my favorite trees, Bechula alligaliensis, yellow birch from the United States. I like it because of its beauty of form. Just look at the color of the bark, the way it's peeling off. It almost looks as if it's metallic, so it's got a really nice sort of shiny, trunk and that's one of the reasons why I really love birch trees because I think they are great for year-round interest. When I was looking at a lot of different images of muscle cells I 
started noticing these black and white patterns. This was one of the reasons why I decided to use birch trees because you can see the same patterns appearing on the tree trunks. I've got a lovely tree to show you. This is the Himalayan birch, Bachelor Utilis Jack Montier. What you can see at this time of year, these beautiful braided male catkins. But interestingly, you can also see the female catkins. Birch trees are suitable for all gardens. They grow in a range of different conditions, a range of different soils. They grow in shade, they grow in light. So a birch tree should grace every single garden, I think. I hope the lasting impact of this garden will be showcasing how high quality outdoor spaces can benefit people who are going through difficult times. And here is the finished garden, looking very good indeed. It feels confident, accomplished, and in its own way, quietly radical. I say radical because there is this convention with Chelsea Gardens that you make it as visible as possible to visitors coming in, whether on the front, on the side, and you have to peer through the trees to see this. There are a lot of them. Trees really do create this sense of woodland and you're at the woodland edge and you're catching glimpses of these glorious irises and the water behind you and also this woodland planting, which is very naturalistic but actually carefully done. But in a sense, it's set against the white of the stems, the black of these stumps, the hard landscaping. This is not a recreation of a wood. It's not simply a pastiche. It's taking the idea of woodland and then creating something from it. And that comes across. This creativity that you see in the garden is absolutely essential to it. Now, I've got its designer, uh, Ula, with me. Ula, hello. Hello. Um, congratulations. Thank you. This is your first garden. Uh, what was it like? What was the experience of doing a first Chelsea? It was great. It was a bit stressful, as expected. Yeah. But overall, we had a great, um, great team working on this garden, so it was quite a pleasure. What you've done here, and I was saying how that you've created the idea of woodland, but you've used, you know, the, I don't know what material you've got on the seats. How did you get that? Charred, charred timber. Um, yeah. And the guy who makes uh, the furniture, Ollie Carter, he lives in the woodland where um, his home is in the woodland, and he goes out and sources timber from that woodland. So it's just charred? It hasn't got any other surface on it it's at all? It's charred, uh, and it has a little treatment on it, right. just a sealant. And yeah. that wall, which, again, you're not going to see in an average woodland, does it represent anything? Is it simply for d decorative reasons? It's decorative reasons, but also has a value like a wild sort of insect um, right. hotel, but trying not to... Not now, to there is always this thing that, that with forest bathing, I understand the immersion and, and giving your senses to it. The visitor can't do that. They can't come on the garden. So how, how are you going to share that whole rich experience with someone looking in from the outside? I think I tried hard to push the trees right onto the boundary of the garden right. to get a bit more sense of this immersive experience. So all of the trees go right up to the boundary and the canopy overspills onto the track. So I'm just hoping that it gives a bit of that so sense. So the garden is just leaching out exactly. across the rest of the showground. Well, it's very beautiful and well done and I hope it goes well. Fingers Thank crossed. Thanks. Now, across the week, we'll be taking a look at some of the planting and design trends that seem to be emerging at RHS Chelsea this year, which may well inspire us all when making choices for our own gardens. And tonight, for the first part of our Chelsea lookbook, Francis Tophill has spotted one particular colour palette. This garden has used purple to really great effect in a limited colour palette of just green, purple and white. And the impact of that is very calming and soothing and quite centering. <laughs> the kind of purple you choose can really affect the feel of the garden as well. So this Circeum is very deep and rich purple, beautiful and quite brooding against the Hesperus, which is very soft and pale and soothing and calming. Also, the stem colour is important. So the selenium has beautiful purple stems with the green foliage that offsets it. 
Now purple generally tend to be a very good colour for attracting wildlife and pollinators. So they can add a little bit of function to your borders as well. And offset with that yellow, it's such a beautiful and striking combination. This garden uses purple foliage very effectively. So things like this Didonia viscosa purpurea. It's a really unusual shrub with lovely purple leaves, but also there's more playful things like bronze fennel, there's purple leafed kale. And all of this purple foliage bounces off the silver foliage, so things like Iliagnus quicksilver, which makes the whole space feel very arid and hot and dry, which is not what you typically expect in a garden that's dominated by deep purple colors. This lovely iris is Deirdre, and it's a really unusual colour of purple. Tonally, it's much more red than the other flowers that we've seen. And against the yellow of its throat, it's just gorgeous. But there's also the deep purples of the opium poppy, the pale purples of the tall bagia, and all different things in between. So if you do want to use purple, purple in your garden. Don't be rigid and stick to the same old purples you've seen over and over again. Be bold and brave and really think about the atmosphere that the purples you use can create within your garden. When we think about colour, we tend to think about how we use it in the garden and maybe overlook how we can use it in our homes. But the colour of houseplants can really affect the mood and atmosphere of our homes. I'm going to have a look. With purple hues, you really get the chance to maximise the drama of your houseplants. Just look at this calathea. That's beautiful variegation on the top of the leaf in different shades of green. But on the underside of the leaf is this dramatic purple colour. It's so beautiful. Now this, because of this different green top, is adapted for very dark conditions. So in a dark house or a dark corner, this will really thrive. This is another of the main show gardens, the National Autistic Society's garden. It's designed for people who live with autism and is trying to capture their experience of everyday life. The cork structures highlight a coping mechanism called masking. When someone adapts their behaviour to try and fit in at work or with friends and family, whereas the inner sanctuary behind it represents an area where they are free to be themselves. Now, Monty, is neither of us... Yeah are autistic. Yep. Um, it's very hard for us to judge that garden from that perspective. But from a show garden perspective, um, what are your thoughts? Well, it's interesting because when I walked past here initially, I thought this is very pleasant, but, but it's very simple. Yeah. You know, you, you have this, this ribbon of candelabra primulas, obviously the court wall and the cornice. And the truth was, I thought, well, I can't really see beyond it. Well, OK, I, I like the court walls, I like yeah. the texture. Um, it is a bit blocky, I I'd think, like from the front. I'd like to see through it a little bit yeah. more. And also, these do block, they do hide they are, very effectively. Yeah, they do, they do, which is part of the story. And then through this division, you come through to a very different, cool, calm space. It's lovely, isn't it? It really is. It's absolutely is. lovely. Yeah, it's delightful. It's and a huge contrast. I think these cork structures work much yeah. better here as well. I really like the I texture. I love the moss. I love the green and yeah. the, the camassias. Yeah, the yeah. river birch, the multi-stem yeah. river birch. Yeah. There's a real sense of place. This is absolutely so beautiful. And, and I could spend a lot of time yeah. in this space, I yeah. have to say. Well, we'll be looking in more depth at this garden with our coverage later in the week. Now, earlier today, RHS Chelsea welcomed their majesties, the King and Queen, and members of the royal family to the showground. Sophie joined the royal tour. They come here year after year to the Chelsea Flower Show, a favourite in the royal calendar, but this is the first time that King Charles has arrived here as patron of the Royal Horticultural Society. The 
first show garden that the King is visiting is this one, the St James's Piccadilly Garden, based on the church in the centre of London, a stone's throw from Buckingham Palace. You've been here year after year, so many years now, but what does it mean when you get a royal visit like that at the end of all this hard work? Having the royal visit really gives you something to aim for uh, at the end of the build, and it's, it's wonderful to have that sort of royal seal of approval. Now, this is Tom Stuart Smith's National Garden Scheme show garden, which the Queen is about to visit. And the whole garden is going to be transferred to a new site in Cambridge for the Maggie's Charity, of which she is patron. What does it mean to you to have the royal visit? It does sort of almost give it a stamp of, of approval, which is, is, is wonderful, not just for me, but for the probably about 50 people who've been involved in this project, so it's very special. She was super interested and absolutely adored the planting, so it's a real privilege and honour to just be able to show around. It's so exciting! For the first time in a very long time, the Royal Party is making an official visit to the balcony and container gardens. The King and Queen are almost at the end of their tour of Chelsea this year, but they have one more garden to see. This is the No Adults Allowed Garden. This garden has been designed by the pupils at a school, a primary school in southwest London. And when the show is over, the whole garden is going to be taken to their playground. It's so great to see the King and Queen out and about. It feels, you know, with the plants, the nurserymen, the gardens, the environment, they're amongst their people. Yeah, I mean, I know that individually and, and together, they genuinely love gardens and gardening. Yeah, yeah. And they share absolutely the same set of pleasures that we all get. Uh, and, you know, I think that that's both uplifting and encouraging for everybody. It gives everybody a boost. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the king is a hands-on gardener, isn't he? Yeah, he actually absolutely. likes to get his hands yeah. in the soil, absolutely. as do we, Monty. Yeah. Now, there's a lot going on this week, isn't there? I mean, there's so much to see out there still. There's yeah. all the there's a lot in the floral pavilion. Yeah, I mean, for I you and seen. I, there's this thing, A, we, we've got to explore parts that we haven't yet reached, but also this idea of, of going back, seeing things, looking more closely, mm. you know, trying to override our initial impressions and really finding more, and that's the privilege that we have. Totally, because initially it can be quite overwhelming, yeah. the Chelsea Flower. There's, yeah. there's, you're being bombarded with yeah. sort of plants and design and images yeah. and yeah. features and things. But... The big thing tomorrow is not what you and I think, it's what the judges thought. Yes. Medals. Yeah, a big deal, this, for everybody yeah. out yeah. there who's being judged. Tonight, they're not going to sleep too well. There's going to be a lot of nail-biting. And it's very, very exciting tomorrow, I've got to say. And uh, we've done our predictions, Monty. Yeah, well, this... We? I mean, I know you're nearly always wrong on this, but 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 I <laughs> I think I've cracked it I'm on year. a losing streak, yeah, let's put it that way. Listen, I in that envelope, yeah. I am confident is best show garden, and the judges will agree with me. If they They'll themselves. agree with you. And what I'm doing is I'm going to give you that so I can't change it, but I want okay. yours. Yes, well, I'm sure the judges will agree with me. Well, I have see. been on a bit of a losing streak, I've got we'll to say. See. We'll but see. We'll it's, see. it's the criteria, isn't it? It's the way they judge it. You know, it's very, very... Yeah. There's points here, it's got to be faultless there. Um, it's not just the gardens we like no. the most. It goes much... It's much more technical than yeah, that. Yeah, there's no sentiment involved. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we'll definitely find out tomorrow one way or another. Also tomorrow is the return of, wait for it, Monty. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Ask Monty and Joe. Looking forward to that, Monty? Well, yes. I mean, I, I'm sure you find the same. Most places I go, I'm asked questions about gardening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we do love to hear from you. So please, get in touch. And all the details are on the screen now. And we will try and answer as many questions as we can throughout the week. Well, that's just about it for tonight. Our coverage of Medals Day here at RHS Chelsea kicks off tomorrow at 3.45 on BBC One with Nikki and Angelica. And Joe and I will be back here at 8 o'clock tomorrow evening with all the excitement from right across the showground. But until then, good night. Good night.
for you. So it breaks down into nine categories. And within that, you want an excellent, or maybe a very good, or a good, or a satisfactory, or, or you don't really want this, but a poor. So think school report. But just to simplify, we're not gonna talk about all nine. We're gonna break that into three. So it's design, construction, and planting. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll have an idea what it takes. A lot of times you hear designers talking about their brief, which is ultimately the story of the garden. But the designer writes it. They set out very early on what they're trying to achieve with their garden. But that 2D then has to change into 3D. It comes alive. The walls, the buildings, even the trees. How does it feel? These forms, these masses, these open areas. So you're gluing all these different things together to create that perfect garden. And then we have the construction. Think about it, these are built in 20 days, but they need to be real. So that construction, the finishes. The right time to do Chelsea because Project Given Back have linked me up with the Muscular Dystrophy UK charity who support people with muscle weakening and wasting conditions. I was really inspired by a guy called Martin. He told me how he was in his early 20s when he was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy and he found himself walking out of the hospital and going to his car because there was no other outdoor place for him to go to process his thoughts. And I just thought Martin's story could have been quite different only if we could provide high quality outdoor spaces where people could go outside of these hospital environments. 
the design of the garden is inspired by the ideas of forest bathing. Today I've come to Wakehurst, this amazing botanic garden with over 500 acres of various woodlands and forests and it's places like this that I draw inspiration from and I'm looking forward to starting with some forest bathing today. So Helena, what exactly is forest bathing? The name forest bathing is inspired by the Japanese practice called Shinrin Yoku and it means bathing in the atmosphere of the forest. It benefits us on so many levels, mentally, emotionally, uh, physically. It has been proven to boost our immune system, calm our nervous system, regulate blood pressure, uh, slow heart rate, just generally give us an overall good feeling of peace and calm. I think I'm quite attracted to this little bit over here because there's a little opening and the tree canopies are coming in and we will have a little snippet of that at Chelsea so I'm going to go with this spot. <laughs> so let's just begin with bringing your awareness to your breathing. Feel the weight of your body onto the earth and for a moment listen for the sound of space. Gently and slowly allow your eyes to open. Notice all the colours. Notice the shapes, the crossing branches, the overlapping leaves. Thank you, that was really peaceful and I feel really grounded and I hope that we can try and bring a little bit of this experience to our Chelsea garden. I love the idea of creating an immersive garden experience. Here, yeah, the idea is to bring the forest down to Chelsea. And in order to do that, we will have more than 50 birch trees in our garden to make this experience possible for everyone to enjoy. You're in the right place here in the National Birch Collection at Wakers. We have over 50 species of birch trees, uh, so hopefully you'll find some inspiration here. This is uh, one of my favorite trees, Bechula alligaliensis, yellow birch from the United States. I like it because of its beauty of form. Just look at the color of the bark, the way it's peeling off. It almost looks as if it's metallic, so it's got a really nice sort of shiny, trunk and that's one of the reasons why I really love birch trees because I think they are great for year-round interest. When I was looking at a lot of different images of muscle cells I started noticing these black and white patterns. This was one of the reasons why I decided to use birch trees because you can see the same patterns appearing on the tree trunks. I've got a lovely tree to show you. This is the Himalayan birch, Bechula utilis Jack Montiai. What you can see at this time of year, these beautiful braided male catkins. But interestingly, you can also see the female catkins. Birch trees are suitable for all gardens. They grow in a range of different conditions, a range of different soils. They grow in shade, they grow in light. So a birch tree should grace every single garden, I think. I hope the lasting impact of this garden will be showcasing how high quality outdoor spaces can benefit people